Hey, how are y'all doing today? I hope you're having a good week. We miss you guys and looking forward to seeing you again real soon. Well, today we are beginning in our government class, uh, the Judiciary Branch, Topic 7. If you've not already taken a few moments to do some vocabulary, I would encourage you to do that. It is on your canvas. You can find the information in your Topic 7 uh, PowerPoint there. I'm going to encourage you to look at that and get on that for a few minutes. We've got a lot to talk about today, so please don't take more than about 10 minutes on that, and then let's get back together. All right, welcome back. Uh, you see on slide three there uh, the, the following. It says the president controls the military, the Congress controls the money, but the judiciary controls the judgment. Have a about a 60-second conversation with your table partners about what this says about our founding fathers and their desire to make sure that there is balance and checks in our governmental system. On slide four there, uh, you see a conversation about the trial of Peter Zenger. Now, Peter Zenger was a publisher and uh, somebody came into his shop and gave him a juicy bit of information about the governor. He was debating on whether or not he should publish that information and decided that, you know what, he should. And so he took that, made an article, published it, and he was arrested and placed on trial for being critical of the government. Now, if you see the date on your slide there, this is really critical because the date is 1733. This is before the Declaration of Independence, before the Bill of Rights. None of that stuff existed. And so he was facing 20, 20 years in jail for speaking negatively about the government. But whenever he was placed on trial, the uh, judge ruled that, that it is the tendency of governments to oppress speech and to limit the ability of people who are publishing information for others to read to try to restrict that speech. So the judge ruled that uh, people should have the right to be critical of their government. And fast forward 40 years, we, we discovered that you know, our founding fathers placed in our Bill of Rights that we have the right to be critical of the government and that we need an impartial judiciary to make sure that that government is held in check and that it does not trample on the rights of people. So uh, hugely critical. So Article 3 in the Constitution deals with the judicial branch. And so this whole conversation that we're having in Topic 7 surrounds Article 3 in the Constitution. And so Article 3, Section 1 says that uh, the Constitution um, provides for a Supreme Court and that, the con that Congress has the authority and the power to establish lower courts that will run in partnership with the Supreme Court. And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, in our uh, in America, because we have what are called district courts, courts of appeals, and then the Supreme Court. The district courts are located around the country, and uh, they are at least in every state. And when it comes to federal law, uh, most cases, almost every case begins in a district court. Now, not every case does, but almost every case does. In matters of of exec when a president makes an executive order, when a president, for example, when President Biden forgave all the student debt, those kinds of things go straight to the Supreme Court. They do not uh, uh, waste time, if you will, in district and uh, appellate courts. So those end up going right to the Supreme Court. But most cases, if, if a question were to be asked on the test, most cases begin in the, at the Supreme Court level, that would be false most cases begin at the district uh, court level. So every state has one, and then if somebody wants to appeal, uh, they would have to appeal to one of the regional courts, and there are 12 of those located around the United States uh, designed to uh, deal with uh, cases on appeal. So you see that there are, um, there are also then special courts that are, are very, um, tailor-made to specific issues, like tax court, for example. Uh, those deal with very specific cases, but most cases go from district court to the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court. Now, 
Uh, you see there on your next slide the issue of jurisdiction, and we're going to use jurisdiction a lot in class, so you're going to want to make sure you know what the word jurisdiction means. It's defined as, the, as to who it is that has authority to hear a case. So if the Supreme Court has jurisdiction, a district court has jurisdiction, an appellate court has jurisdiction, a state court has jurisdiction, what we're really saying is who has the constitutional authority to hear the case? And that's why the next slide that you have deals with exclusive and concurrent jurisdiction. Because that's all about who has the right to hear a case. Does the federal court have the right to hear a case or does a state court have the right to hear a case? And so that's all about um, who's going to hear it. And so on a test, if you're asked um, if, a, if an adoption should be heard, an adoption case or a child custody case or a speeding ticket case, um, is to be held in a state or a federal court, you're going to know that the jurisdiction of that is going to be a state court because that has nothing to do with constitutionality or with the Constitution. So um, you need to make sure that you know um, who has what case and uh, who's responsible for what case. And so what cases go in federal court? Anything that deals with constitutionality, anything that's like if, if somebody in Florida were to sue somebody in Georgia, that's probably going to be in a federal courthouse because neither the, neither states has responsibility for that. So um, the original jurisdiction is where the case is heard. The appellate jurisdiction is a case that's heard on appeal. And then you see there the role of a judge. Now this is what I'd like you to spend a few moments talking about, is if you were a judge, would you experience judicial restraint or would you use judicial activism? So what's the difference? Judicial restraint is the belief that um, you're trying to figure out what was the original intent of our founders for the Constitution. Judicial activism is that you believe that the Constitution continues to need to be reinterpreted, so you're going to rule on a case based on the evolutionary understanding of the Constitution. So talk to each other for a few minutes on what you would be if you were a judge. Would you be an activist or would you experience judicial restraint? Talk a few minutes and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So one of the most challenging uh, issues related to the courts today is who we're going to elect and what philosophy of approach do they have? So when you go to the ballot box, now that you're either 18 or approaching uh, 18 years old, you're trying to figure out what philosophy the judge has on the ballot. A lot of times people ignore what, they're, what the judges are, but this is a critical mistake as a member of the voting population. You want to know if the judges are going to be an activist or if they're going to experience judicial restraint going to be hugely critical for you as a voter. Well, I hope you guys have had some good conversations together, and uh, you see there some of those, uh, like judicial restraint, judicial activism, those are things that are going to be critical for you to remember um, on the test that is ahead. Hope you're having a great day. You matter, and we look forward to seeing you here in a few days.